Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit Framework demo meeting. Uh, getting on into April, it's starting to feel a little bit like springtime. Maybe. And we've got some cool stuff to cover, so let's dive in. Framework highlights, including new modules. We have seven new modules this time around, many of them related to remote code execution. Uh, three of these new modules come from community contributor Akamdo, and they target vulnerable versions of Oracle's WebLogic server, specifically in how Java serialized objects get deserialized. These exploits work without authentication and will result in remote code execution on the target. And I believe we have a demo of this today. Um, also to note, if you're interested in learning more about exploiting Java serialized objects, uh, check out Aaron Soto and John Hart's research white paper that we mentioned in the previous Metasploit demo meeting. It's available on the Rapid7 website. We also have a new module targeting a vulnerability in CMS Made Simple, which is an open source content management system that is also known as CMSMS, from community contributor Fabio Cogno. For vulnerable versions running the Showtime 2 module, which is a module for automating slideshows, a user with proper credentials for that module can gain remote code execution. And community contributor Blight Zero created a module which exploits two vulnerabilities in Cisco RB320 and RB325 routers running vulnerable firmware to gain unauthenticated remote code execution. From community contributor Hoodie comes a scanner module targeting popular Android application ES File Explorer, which has over 100 million downloads to date, according to the Google Play Store. Vulnerable versions of this app run an open HTTP server which responds to requests for device info, enumeration of files and applications, and also allows the downloading of files. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. Lastly, we have a new hardware bridge module, uh, post module from community contributor Pietro Biondi to flood a CAN bus interface with a set of user supplied frames. This might be handy for folks who have a can do attitude. Uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there's no more, I don't think. All right. And so we'll move on to enhancements and features. So additional work outside of modules. Community contributor Hoodie provided several improvements to the framework cracking and hashing functionality, including the ability to export credentials in the John the Ripper format by specifying the .jtr extension when you're providing a file name with the creds.o command. Also support for a new advanced option called delete temp files, which can prevent the deletion of temporary files related to password cracking in cases where there's still a value. And also centralizing some duplicate hash identifier code into one central library. Really good stuff. From community contributor R. Wincy, we have support for newer Outlook versions uh, to the Windows Gather Credentials Outlook Post module. This module can now gather credentials from Outlook 2013, 2016, and Office 365. Community contributor Avanzo added documentation and also support for newer versions of Splunk to the Splunk Upload App Exec exploit module. Very cool. And from community contributor Green M comes some enhancements to MSF Console's load command by adding tab completion and a new dash S, dash S switch. I'll say that three times fast. That displays loaded plugins. And uh, community contributors B Coles and Green M made several error handling improvements, which everyone always appreciates. Let's see here. And bug fixes. We have some bug fixes. Uh, B Coles fixed a version detection issue in the Postgres create lang exploit module and also improved the version detection while he was at it. Community contributor Brimstone provided a fix from interpreter's paranoid mode by adding a missing database method. Uh, also a quick plus one for a great GitHub avatar. Check it out. Uh, our own Matthew Kino uh, fixed an issue with the generation of payloads where when the payload UID tracking is enabled, these payloads would be assigned to non-existent workspaces as console startup. And Brendan Waters updated payloads to pick up fixes for both the Java and PHP interpreters. Yay. You can read all the details in the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. And with that, time for demos. So uh, as Pierce already mentioned, we had the uh, kind of JSO white paper come out which talked about uh, some of these web logic vulnerabilities in detail. Uh, and for those who have uh, been paying close attention, we've had a web logic deserialization vulnerability for a while now. Uh, but what we're referring to is uh, a burst of three uh, that uh, have been submitted, uh, discovered by the community and, and submitted uh, in total. And so it's taken us some time to go through those. Uh, for those who haven't played with Java deserialization vulnerabilities, uh, generally you have to have a, a Java serialized object, and uh, that 
was a giant binary blob. So if you want, you can actually take a look at any one of these. And we've gone ahead and reverse engineered all of those and tried to document them as best as possible. Uh, and so I would encourage you to do that only because it took me a lot of time to do and it would make me happy if someone else got to, you know, <laughs> enjoy it. Um, so we'll just take one as an example here. Unicast Ref uh, is the most recent of these three uh, that's landed. And so as you kind of take a look, uh, scroll through here, you'll notice that there's some blobs in here. And this is because uh, although we've added some YSO serial modules recently, uh, or YSO serial libraries uh, to our, uh, our Metasploit framework, we haven't uh, yet integrated this functionality, this JMRP listener, which uh, basically kind of sets up a callback uh, for, a, for a stager. Uh, but everything that we could, you'll notice as you go through here, we've broken apart uh, the Java serialized objects and talked through uh, what the, the structure looks like. And so uh, obviously that's a bit beyond the purpose of the demo today, but I just wanted to highlight that that's in there now. Um, and so hopefully as we see some of these uh, JSO uh, vulnerabilities coming in in the future, they'll kind of follow that model and make it a lot easier for people to learn. Uh, but in any case, to the demo, uh, we have here a Windows 10 machine. Uh, this is running uh, Oracle WebLogic. And so this is uh, a combination web server um, that has actually runs a bunch of different protocols, one of which is called T3, and that uses Java serialized objects to communicate, and that's what we're hoping for. So our machine here is uh, 199.152. Let's go ahead and set this up. Do -do. With some good typing. Um, and you notice that's really about all there is to it. We do have SSL support in here, but we don't really need it. Um, we will go ahead and use, uh, let's do a, uh, <laughs> oh no, a tab completed. Oh God, oh God. <laughs> One moment, please. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do. Ah. Oh. So how's everybody say? All right, cool. <laughs> um, let's do find TCP. Um, actually, you know what, no, I'll take it back. That was a bad idea. I'll stick with it first. That's good. That's easier. Save me a step. Am I spelling this right? Why am I tab completing? All right, we'll just fall back. We'll leave it uh, as... Mm. Windows. I'm having a bad typing day, sorry. All right, let's make sure that's still good. That's good. All right, let's just throw it, see what happens. Um, so ideally what should happen is we should go through a few different stages here, one of which is uh, negotiating T3. Uh, the second is using this JMRP listener to call us back on port 8080. Uh, and then the third is to upload the interpreter payload uh, to call us back. So in theory, we'll see if this actually works. Oh, God darn it. Bless it to Sam Hill. <laughs> oh, my, my local elbows changed. Okay, fair enough. That's fair. So we called this back. I just wasn't listening on it, or it didn't have my uh, stages set up properly. Let's give this another go. <clears throat> yeah, all right, cool. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is uh, Java serialization or deserialization vulnerabilities uh, by their nature give us 100% success rate. We're not dealing with any kind of memory corruption. We're not dealing with anything that really should be putting the system in an unstable state. Um, so the good news is this should always uh, end up coming back with a session, and there it is. Um, so notice we're running as the local user. I will also point out that this, uh, by its nature as well, does print a little bit to the console here. So you will see that we do have uh, an error. Each one of these uh, kind of prints its own exception. Um, I don't think there's a way for us to silence this. If a member of the community would like to step forward with some better knowledge on that, I'm absolutely interested to see if uh, there's some improvements to be made. But right now, that's just kind of a side effect uh, to be aware of. So, yeah, happy to take any questions, but. So I guess for now, a defender could just look through those logs to see if they're being exploited. Exactly, right. But hey, 100% success rate. Yeah, right, that's, yeah. that's not too exactly. shabby, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, awesome. All right, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. All right, and I think we have a bonus demo uh, uh, coming soon, as it were. Right, and Jacob, you gonna you gonna show us something? Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. uh, sharing. Um, so that's <coughs> actually a Zimbra running on a Ubuntu server. Um, so. I guess the reason why this is bonus, it hasn't been landed yet, um, but the module PR is up there, uh, still waiting for a final test. Um, let's see. So, so uh, I wrote this module kind of uh, after reviewing or reading this blog post. It kind of goes over 
two different uh, RCE paths in Zimbra. Um, I've, I worked on the first kind of chain. Uh, let's see. So I did modify the HTTP client lib for this demo just to print out the requests, not the responses. Um, so it's kind of easier to walk through. I already have all the options set, so it should work. Yeah, it looks like it's working. Uh, just one other thing. Perl here. Um, so I printed out all the requests just to kind of go over it. Um, so this auto discover, uh, the request goes to auto discover servlet. That's the thing that's actually vulnerable to the XXE. Um, so right here, we're referencing the external DDT, which is what I curled out over here. Um, and this one is grabbing a file, the local config file off of the system. And it's doing that because we want a password for a Zimbra user, which is like an internal user that's used for communications. Uh, throw that in within a C data block so the XML that's dumped in here won't be parsed further. Uh, and then once we get that, we go back over here and parse out the password. So then that password is used um, in an auth request. Uh, right here, we'll see the Zimbra user and then the password we just grabbed. Um, that's to get a, a user token, but this user token isn't an admin token yet. So then we had to uh, exploit a server side request vulnerability. Um, so we see right here, uh, we're targeting the local host 7071, um, proxying that. So it, that request is being made internal on the Zimbra server side. Um, and basically that allows us to get a admin uh, cookie. So there's kind of a, a two parts to this uh, proxy one. Um, this request is actually going to 8443, but the code checks the port number that you provide. So this is user provided. We could change it if it sees uh, 7071. It's saying this is admin request. Um, and then it checks the cookie. So since it's admin request, it checks for admin cookie. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll see over here, it's ZM auth token. Uh, over here, I, you basically just change the name to ZM admin auth token. So it's kind of related, like if it's an admin, you have a token named that, um, but we're not really using an admin cookie yet. So kind of the same auth request here without the XXE to get a valid admin cookie. Uh, and that's basically just upload our shell. So that goes through uploads our shell, which is all that stuff. And then over here, yeah, just make a request to the right URL and then you should get um, a shell, Zimbra user, uh, and then this version, ZM control, you could check what version of Zimbra is installed. So you have a couple of vulnerabilities there to exploit, but get a shell that works out well. <laughs> nice. yeah. So it's not quite an unauthenticated code execution, it's just if they give you the authentication, just yeah. like, okay, here's the keys, it's underneath the map yeah. kind of scenario. So okay. you use the XXE to get the creds and mm -hmm. then the creds uh, you have to proxy it, so you do need the server-side request vulnerability too mm -hmm. um, to get an admin cookie. But yeah, it, you end up being authenticated by the time you get code execution. But start from unauthenticated. Any questions for Jacob or Aaron? Mm -hmm. great. That was great. That was really good demos. Yeah. Let's see, we've got uh, a few minutes here. If any, there's any last-minute demos, anybody has you know anything? What? I can demo. Oh, all right. Adam, Adam has risen to the challenge. Thank you, Adam. It's yours to grab, man. All right. Let's make sure I get the right window. Uh, so this is some work I did for our Hacksmith blog series post back in December or January, whenever it got published. Um, and it's been landed now in metal, uh, the uh, metal, the POSIX interpreter tree for a while. Um, hasn't made its way into framework quite yet, um, but we're working on those build issues and eventually we'll get it sorted out. Um, but I can go ahead and demo it. So on uh, Windows Interpreter, one of the more popular advanced features is being able to execute a file solely in memory, being able to upload your own executable and run it in a separate process um, without actually touching disk at all, which bypasses a ton of AV detections. 
um, and leaves less traces around for like if you're actually trying to be stealthy and all that. Uh, but doing that on Linux hasn't really been possible, uh, especially not through Meterpreter until today. So we've got here a handler that I'm going to set up. And over here, I've got my specially built Meterpreter. Uh, we're running it under strace so that we can see sort of what someone auditing syscalls would see uh, if they were trying to just look at process lifetime. So we can see uh, immediately on start that we our shell does the exec VE. Adam, I think you're only sharing one screen. Uh oh. Oh, it's only sharing one tab of my one screen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's at the top. It's just yeah, but I'm totally it. focused on the other tab. Oh, okay, yeah. Wow. It looks like it's frozen. It's frozen. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's cool. No, Zoom doesn't, doesn't look like it's frozen. Oh, yeah, no, my is. Zoom is frozen, yeah. Technology's fun. I think it's just because it thinks that tab is in the background, that it freezes. Maybe. I don't know. Who, let's see. Yeah, my computer's not. There you go. Oh, no, sharing is paused. Bring your share window to the front. Yeah. So if I, oh, and I can't click resume share on this separate tab. <laughs> it looks like it treats each tab as its own Wow, window. that's actually pretty good. <laughs> um, <laughs> That'd be really impressive if it was doing another screen. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, so apologize for that. Um, anyway, so we can see the S-trace over here. Um, with the startup, the shell did an exec VE, uh, which is what shells do. Uh, and our goal is to avoid any more of these. Um, we see the clone here, and that's starting our logging thread, uh, which maybe we could turn off if we, when we don't have it logging on like we do right now. Um, and other than that, it's uh, pretty quiet on startup. Um, so over here, we've got our interpreter shell open. And if we do execute I, dash f uh, user bin u name uh, should be enough. No? That's interesting. That's new. Maybe I wasn't ready to demo. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is speaking to you. Did I pass the wrong flags? Yeah, now my framework got a little mad at me since I killed the last one. There it is. Okay. Um, so we can do system bow and then we can do error execute dash h and we get all of these nifty options. Um, and so to show what like executing a normal file would look like under strace, we can do execute dash i to make it interactive and dash C to make sure that it's got a channel allocated. And then yeah, dash F, your name. Wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can guarantee you some code executed. I'm not sure what. Uh... <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, hmm. yeah. Well, I'm going to Skip maybe this part and just do the in-memory execution because that one works. Or it was working. So was this though. Congratulations, Aaron. Yours wasn't the most full of fail. Yeah, I'm I, I appreciate you <laughs> <laughs> snatching the baton from my hand. <laughs> I'm curious, what, what kind of AB might actually do any kind of on disk analysis on so this platform? So ever since either the late 2.6s or the early 3.0s, Linux has had a full syscall auditing uh, interface built into it, sort of like Mac OS has. Um, so eventually, if there are any Linux equivalents of Little Snitch or something, um, that will uh, 
that would do something. Uh, Silent uses a lot of syscalls as part of its behavioral thing uh, that it does, uh, because basically everything you, that you can do that are interesting and nasty behaviors um, in Linux are done via syscalls. Um, and so avoiding as many of the process life cycles to, make, to avoid triggering the machine learning or whatever of, oh, you're starting a new thing that I need to audit, uh, the better. All right, so let's just give straight to execute dash M, which is our in memory flag, uh, previously not supported on Linux. And um, then we can do dash F, you name. I do have a local copy and we'll make sure. Uh, I do have a local copy of my uname executable uh, to run on there. Um, all right, and dash I for, or we'll just do dash C to channelize it. Um, and then we'll pass in the dash A argument with dash A, dash A, which is a little weird. So we're just executing uname dash A at this point. All right. So if we do read one then, uh, and we can read from channel one, and we actually did this, and we can go over here, um, and we can see that we didn't, after we did the initial execute here from the shell on this session, uh, we did a fork, um, but then there's no exec VE, even though we uploaded just the generic uname executable and ran it without any having to have any extra special tooling around all of that. That works on any executable, not just muscle. Static yeah, not pi. just muscle, static pi or whatever. It'll work on uh, the vast majority of executables shipped with modern Linux distros. That's super cool. Yeah, um, and maybe, maybe it was the dash I that was causing Metal to crash. Um, mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> this, this is this is a preview of, of coming soon. It's it's yes. most of the work's been done. It's coming just soon. fixing fixing errors. Yeah, and as soon as we figure out what that other thing is causing <laughs> everything else to crash. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, super cool. Nice. Awesome. Any questions on the line or in the room for Adam? How soon is soon? Um, well, it's already landed, so it's as soon as the gym gets built. Sweet. Okay. Uh, which we've been building gyms has always been fun with the newest rubies and getting bundler and ruby gyms and all of that to play in concert. We got most of those jobs fixed a few months back, but this one got overlooked. Gotcha. So beyond memory size, is there any other limitation in terms of the size of the executable that you have uh, No, it works with arbitrary executables. The format of Linux executables is actually uh, pretty straightforward and easy to work with and there's a header file for doing it already baked in. Um, and so, yeah, no, it's not a size limitation thing. Um, and it works by invoking the uh, native linker on that system, uh, which does actually all of the really hard work of loading libraries and managing all of that process state. Um, it turns out that the kernel doesn't do most of that in Linux. It's all almost all done in user space. And so that means that we can do it. So what it's supposed to be a blue team looking for now if, if these kind of things are not shown in, in, uh, in the labs? Um, so let's see, I can do percent process. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, if I go through here, and I'm gonna have to wait for it to reconnect again. I can show you, um, so inside of like the standard process lifecycle ones, it's very hard to catch. Like there's a fork that goes on, uh, but that happens like legitimately in a lot of places. And as soon as this pops open, we can see that there are some shady, slightly memory allocations that go on. Um, but there are some techniques that don't use those allocations, but use a different set of shady syscalls. So there's, uh, three or so uh, different patterns that you would need to look for now in order to catch something instead of just looking for exec VE. Wow. That's awesome. um, yeah, or maybe this won't open it. It just doesn't like me today. It's fine. Yeah. It's this end of the room, Aaron. Yeah, That's what so it is. We got one, one minute. So. Yeah, <laughs> well. Oh, and also look for random tick faults. <laughs> yeah, random tick faults. That's always a good thing to look for. Yeah.
That's super cool. At the very least, you'll fix some code. Yeah, there you go. Excellent.